It's a great pleasure to have you here in our webinar about the PILS remote I.O. system for SIPSAFE and PROFISAFE. Now I would like to start introducing what it is, the PILS remote I.O. system. So it is a I.O. system for safe and non-safe inputs and outputs and also analog functions. We'll talk a little bit more about what it is later on, which can be connected to a PLC or a, a soft PLC on a HMI. And uh, in this picture, we show as well existing other controllers from PILS like the PSS 4000, which is a integrated safe and uh, standard controller. But for today, we concentrate on the IO system. Now, we're not only having the IO system for cabinet based, um, yeah, systems and uh, yeah, but as well for, let's say, IP67 being outside uh, on the machine, cabinet free. So you see here, for instance, one guy, which for the moment is uh, launched with Profinet, but will be integrating SIP safety later on as well, or other guys who work with, for instance, one of our other controllers, a small controller system, not small T. This is just to give you a relation on what we're talking about. So today, the focus is on PSSU Universal 2. Okay, let's, let's see a little bit what we can do with it. So let's assume you're having a PLC somewhere in Europe, you can use as an IO platform, the PSSU2, you just exchange the head module for the other one with SIP safety, and you can leave your installation, your IO modules like they are. You just have to exchange the head module. Um, we have a high density with left widths. We'll get to that point later. And you also have safety related relay outputs and a uh, removable memory card for an easy replacement of the head and, module. And, and Thomas, one yeah. thing I'd like to add here is, yeah, this is one of the key points of the PSSU2 product is you know, having the Profisafe and the SIP safety. Um, when you exchange a head module, the IO modules remain the same and you can change your control systems. For So for those OEMs who are building machinery that one day they need to use maybe a Siemens system and the next, for another customer, they need to use a Rockwell system. The I.O. can stay in place and stay the same, not only in the main cabinet, but also in the remote cabinets as well. Perfectly. Thanks for that addition, Mike. So this is exactly what you're saying. So you could, for instance, take a AB, a Rockwell or an Amron, or you use a Siemens, for instance. And then as an I.O. platform, you use just one, which is PILS. And um, you have only one address and the head module to uh, address the whole system. That's another benefit you're having. You know, you don't need to have uh, um, contra um, sorry, <laughs> the relevant modules for each of the communication modules. And you can as well mix, freely mix the safety IOs and the standard IOs. Just to mention, one head module can drive up to 64 modules in total, where 24 can be on safety. Yeah, what would be your benefits? So we just mentioned it's one IO platform, yeah, and we're also having a, a lot of applications with various robot controllers. Then you have really a high density of IO modules, which means that um, there are modules with half the width of usual modules out in the market. We have the safety relay outputs available for higher current load applications. So you save in the system, you save money and time um, because you and, don't need an additional relay. And also, it saves uh, panel space from having interposing relays uh, driven off of semiconductor outputs. You can drive your load directly off the relay module, the safe relay module that's located in the uh, I.O. Perfectly. And I think, Mike, it's up to six amps per relay module. Yeah, six or I believe it's eight amps, depending on the type of load. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. So and um, 
already mentioned in the movie, there's a removable memory card for easy replacement. So um, you have the whole configuration as mentioned on the head module only, and this is driving via the module bus, the IO. So your uh, engineering work or maintenance work is reduced considerably. Then what would be, let's say globally the benefits, it is flexible because you can use it and adapt it just by exchanging the head module to the different um, uh, buses. Then you have safety as a basic function. You need no protocol specific IO modules. It's just the head modules which manage the whole system. And it's compact. You have uh, up to 16 IO on a 12.5 millimeter width, which is maybe half an inch, something like that. And here you go. If we now dive into the head modules, we're having only two head modules, which is the Ethernet IP module for Ethernet IP safe safety and with BOTP protocol for IP address assignment and equivalent, the Profinet Profisafe, which is then a shared device. And both of them, they are capable to connect up to 24 safe modules and in total, 64, which means if you're having a look at a at your project, in total you need less head modules. So the price depends also on your on your configuration of the whole project. So, for instance, if you would need uh, 50 um, different modules in other systems, you may need two head modules to because they cannot drive the 50. So that would be a clear also uh, economical benefit. Now, you can do some other nice things like we're having a active backplane. What does it mean? So you could leave, for instance, um, you could hot swap uh, a module if you need to exchange it or you wanna make a, a trial or whatever, and the system will not stop because as mentioned, the head module is driving the system. Additionally, you can leave empty slots. You could say, okay, option one, I'll leave it for this machine or that module. And option two, I'll leave it for another one, which means for instance, in future, you may have it filled up like this one, you know, on the lower end, on the lower left-hand side. So there's a lot of uh, modules available, but that will be shown in a live demo, Mike Canada will, show it live, what you can do. I think that's more practical, more visual rather than showing you a table. Now, what would be additional benefits? So you have from the principle, you have a so-called three-piece architecture. I'll get into that point in the next slide. So you have a optimized handling for the commissioning and for the servers. So in terms of total cost of ownership, you save time in the commissioning phase or in the maintenance phase. Where you can do a structured cabling, which means we have uh, patch modules, which you could do a side of a input module and use those patch module with 24 volts or zero volts, for instance, to have a structured cabling. And if you cable one sensor, you do it just vertical, uh, sorry, horizontal, and they have a clear assignment. All sensor it, um, inputs are on line five, for instance, or on line 30 or wherever. Then we have uh, pinpoint error localization. I'll get to that point a little bit clearer later. And we have, as mentioned, those modular backplanes, which also uh, um, ensure easy removal for uninterrupted communication during swaps. Yeah. Now, what does it mean, this three-part system structure? We're having only two terminal blocks, one with eight pin and one with 16 pin. You have the different modules available and you have two choices of backplane. Yeah? You have uh, this one and a four times backplane and this all together gives you a part of the system. And what would be the benefits? Um, you can swap modules without rewiring, for instance, uh, because you can un, uh, dismount the terminal block independent 
from the electronic module. You can pre-wire all of those and then just snap them in into the hardware once the hardware installed on the Dean rail. Um, and other positive benefits, small things, but very nice things to save you time and money in the end. So as mentioned, the terminal blocks is a eight pin or a 16 pin. And you see here in all of them, you have those openings for test probes, which also makes your life easier during commissioning or maintenance. Most of them are having the width of 12.5 millimeters. And we're also providing here a strain relief through the cable tiles ties. Then you can make it really EMC robust because you can clip on a optional shielding device here externally on the whole thing with the advantage it easily snaps into the back plane and it has a very low resistance and low inductive connection to the thin rail which would be here on that part. Then you have obviously labeling options, so you can uh, use a transparent polycarbonate label carrier here, or you could even use optional label carriers here on the back plane. And also you can use transparent clips with uh, markers, with colored markers. For instance, as I mentioned, if you want to do this structured cabling to mark blocks of what you're doing in, in the inputs, you know, if you have, for instance, a conveyor belt, you mark it blue or whatever color you like to do. But we're talking about the pinpoint of uh, error diagnostic. So you're having basically a status LED on top of each of the module, which normally is green, but if there's anything going wrong, it would um, flash red to indicate that in this column something is wrong. And then you would have additionally, exactly for each of the pins which are here on the module, you would have an equivalent LED, which then indicates on which um, channel, if you like, uh, the error occurs. So if that is flashing, you immediately know it's on that pin or you get your message, obviously, maybe to your PLC, but that's something visual which is quite convenient. Which one, means one thing to add here yeah. is you'll yeah. you'll notice too that uh, you know every module has sixteen LED spots on the top of it, sixteen yeah. different LEDs that could light up. And even though like this module here only has eight slots, you still use that same. Everything's one through sixteen, and the lines all line up left and right, one through sixteen as well. So exactly. Right. So for instance, eight would be blanked out because it's not on this. And uh, but right. you have always the same, the same. Yeah, that's right. consistency. Thanks, Mike, for the addition. Yep. Then you can code the slots. There's, let's say, two ways of coding: a mechanical coding. So you can you have this kind of accessory. You can input the code. You can put up to or realize up to twenty different codings, which means you cannot put your wrong terminal on the wrong module. That's one thing. And the other thing, it's kind of electronic slot coding. So even if you would not do this mechanical coding, the system will recognize that you input the wrong module in terms of the um, in terms of the configuration which you set. And Mike will show you just in a right. second how to configure. And that's it, Mike. Okay. Now it's your Great. turn. Please share your okay. screen. All right, let's do that. Okay. Everybody see my screen? Yep. It's coming. Okay. Great. Yep. Yep. Yeah. So this is this is the pass config software, and you'll see here in the pass config software, I'm going to start a new project. Okay. 
And then right away it pops up and asks me, okay, it's just PSSU2. Do I want Profinet or Ethernet IP? And also within this, you can see the PDP67 block that Thomas mentioned for Profinet is also a choice here. This is all done within the same configurator, but we're gonna to focus today on these. And today I'm gonna to choose Ethernet IP. And this happens to be our 328072 part number. And we had a predecessor to that, the Ethernet IP original, which still exists, but everything new would be the 328072, which has can do up to 24 slices of safety, whereas the predecessor uh, was limited a uh, little less than that. So, okay. Okay, now I have to set an IP address. And, and whatever your IP address is that you set for the unit, <clears throat> it comes up with four empty slots. Now this, this you don't, if you only have two slots and you only need to use two, I could just delete this and then add single slot backplane modules here, for instance. But we'll stick with the four slot as well. And so you'll see down here, here's my choices of modules that I can add into those slots. And what I can do here is, you know, digital fail-safe inputs. We have an eight-point fail-safe input. I added one in one of those in there, just double clicking. And then I also have digital fail-safe outputs. Here's my relay output, which is a little unique, having the ability to do relay outputs as we discussed earlier. And then also I have some other ones, including a two amp, four, four two amp outputs, or this is more common, the eight uh, channels of half amp output. Now, one of the things you'll notice is, um, you know, essentially, you know, I can uh, go down and add some non-safe outputs as well, inputs and outputs, I'll do that. Here's a 16 point all in one channel, as Thomas mentioned earlier. Um, and then I can add some, outputs as well. Now you notice I'm getting a warning up here. And this warning is essentially, and if I scroll this down a little bit, you'll see I've run out of power supply. And it tells me that. So I can go down here to supply voltage and I can add a power supply module and then all my warnings go away. And essentially this is just refreshing the power supply. The base module has eight amps of power and then I can add eight more amps if needed as I build the system. There's also, I won't go into it too much detail today, but other ways to you know, reduce the, if you know you're only using 100 milliamps per point on the output, you can then customize a module and tell the system that so you don't need to refresh the power as often. So just a little key point there that uh, you could do. Um, we talked about patch terminals uh, as well. Um, these are the patch terminals, so I can add you know, zero volts here. And then I can add, if I add 16 points of 24 volts, and these are all right in a row, if I add this 24 volt here, now the power supply needs more power because I just added eight more amps of required power. So I could put another power supply in there. So that's a little bit about, you know, some of the modules that are available. Um, again, I also have, I skipped over this and I'll tell you, we have the analog input modules standard analog input modules. We have standard analog output modules. We do have a fail-safe uh, analog output module, uh, or I'm sorry, fail-safe analog input module coming soon, um, but it's not uh, not here yet. So just wanted to let you know about that. One last module I wanna show you about here is a IO link module. So I can put an IO link module here. And again, I need some power as uh, since I added eight more amps of capability, so I'll put a power supply in front of that IO link module. But if I go on this IO link module, I can right click on this and I can launch the IO link configurator. And in here, I can then go configure, create a new IO link project and configure IO link devices and what have you. I'm not gonna you know, go into detail on that today, but just wanna let you know that that capability is there. Now, once I built this system, I can go up here and under, system i can view the process image <clears throat> process image tells me fail safe inputs how many bytes of data am i using and also what is this input assembly number and you'll see that come up in a few minutes uh, where we use that uh, similarly for fail safe outputs 
And then the standard outputs, how many bytes of data. And because the IO link safety uses a lot of uh, data, you'll see that's 134 bytes. And then here, 129 bytes on the output side, again, because the IO link, I, I think I might have just said IO link safety. This is actually IO link standard. Um, but yeah, the IO link uses that many uh, bytes of data. We at PILS do have IO link safety uh, devices coming. Um, that's another subject of another webinar. <laughs> so, but um, okay. So that uh, gives you a little bit of idea of that. Let me go down here and also show you. So for a Rockwall system, for instance, I'm going to export the L5X file is what I would do. I'd click here and I'd export this to my computer and then be able to go pull that L5X file up in the Rockwall software. And what I'm going to do at this point is show you a video of how that is done. And this is a video, since I don't have Rockwell software in front of me today, I'm going to you know, use this video and I'll pause it to, to explain some things. Here you'll see we have a Rockwell processor, L71S, and we have a safety partner. And then we also have, has set up an Ethernet IP adapter. And so this will show you what's needed in the next steps. You can right click, import the module. And you're going to the L5X file that you have stored on your computer. And this is a different system than the one I just created, but uh, just for reference, you'll see here that remote module, you bring that in, click OK, import that module. Now that module has been imported and there it is. It shows up on the IO tree on the left. Now you'll notice here, here's some of the, under the input, Assembly instance, the safety input. There's the you know the number 772, the 769 that we looked at before, and here's for this system, the byte size is five and one byte uh, accordingly. Now you'll see here. Then we generate in the Rockwell software a safety network number. So we generate that and copy that. We go back into the Pills software, and we go ahead and set that right here into the pill software just paste that in there click ok and then we restart the system right here once the system's restarted we now go and go to the process image where we have the configuration signature um, so this configuration signature i paused again here is a checksum and a date time and date stamp right down to the millisecond that we then go back and enter into the rockwell software to verify that we are communicating to the correct module that's a safety signature maybe you're familiar with that but that's you know here is how you do that the checksum goes into this spot in the rockwell software and then we put the time and date right down to the millisecond and you'll see the 550 milliseconds over on the right and we can do the exact uh, time right down to that and so that safety signature means that nothing has changed on that module because if we go and change anything on the system obviously that time and date will change and the safety signature would no longer be valid <clears throat> so now we're running we're going to go and Download this to the Rockwell controller now that we did the safety signature to it. I'm going to go online, download, and now you'll see it'll be running. And that module will be active. Back into run mode. And you'll see down the bottom left, it shows running. And you also see, you know, the remote IO module there as well. And now, we're going to go back offline and build a small ladder network and show using the IO that we just created. And you'll see here, I'm going to pause in a second here. Once you pull this up, you'll see the remote IO module that we created, remote IO. And you'll see here, here's our. EF8DI, which is our eight-point input module, and we're going to choose the bit from there. So it's all spelled out within the Rockwell software. Choose that bit. We're going to choose bit zero for that, for the input. And then similarly on the output, going in and pulling again, here's the ef 8DO half amp module. So we're choosing bit zero of that module. And then now 
We got to download that to the controller. And you'll see when we change the I.O. And we turn the input on, you'll see the output come on. So fairly uh, easy to add this into the Rockwell controller and using the Studio 5000 software and our past config software. And you'll see here when we turn the input on, the output comes on. So hopefully that helps, uh, you know, take any mystique out of how to connect this to the Rockwell and what have you. It's, you know, very simple to do by importing that L5X file and, um, you know, allowing this to communicate uh, with the Rockwell. Um, we have some tech, tech notes on this and what have you, and obviously this uh, video that I just showed. Um, so we have some support uh, that your local salespeople can provide to you as well. Um, so yeah, really, really, that's what I wanted to show you today with regards to, you know, how to integrate. And also with the, if we're working with a Siemens system, I don't have the demo on that today, but um, we can easily show you that as well in the future. That allows you to um, use the TIA portal, and you can open the pass config right from the TIA portal. So, okay. Thanks a lot, Mike. It's great, great explanation in a nutshell. Really, I'm impressed. Love it. Okay, if you guys have questions, we will be coming to the question section in a in a few minutes so i just want to show a few of the example applications there's a nice uh, youtube from a guy who's showing for instance how i could link the uh, pills um, remote aisle together with the arm run based on ethernet ip for instance and then you go we're having a few a lot of um, application in robot cells for instance where we use the pssu io and some of our guard logging devices, for instance, that's in automotive and also in aeronautical aerospace application, surface finishing, deburring, grinding, polishing. Or if you see this one as well in automotive, that's a, a part of a welding cell where our PCSU products are used as well as light curtains or magnetical lock device. We also provided services in this project through a system integrator, or here you see a other robot cell in packaging, you know, for pelletizing or other means, or in this manufacture leads for cans, for instance, um, that's through an OEM. And uh, here you go with a diverse or other application in process industries. Um, this is a container, and in here, in here, you need to have, uh, you know, to uh, control analog values and stuff like that. And you see here, um, a just a hardware picture of our device. 